Hey everybody, welcome to our third installment of Portraits what, of What Moves Sir. I'm so excited to have all of you here today and I'm very, very excited about our topic today. We have two special guests with us who will be helping us kick off and really have control of the dialogue today. I will be jumping back in at the end to do some Q&A and to wrap up the session as well. As a reminder, this is being recorded and you will be able to find the recording on blog.caldwellbanker.com forward slash portraits of what moves her at a later date. As always, please put your questions into the Q&A in the chat and we will get to those as we move through the program. So I'm thrilled to have with us today Realogy's Senior Vice President of Human Resources, Tanya Rue Narvaez. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you, Sue. It's great to be back here at what moves her. I know, it's so exciting. The last one, I think we were in Chicago or something, right? We were, we were out and about That's together one of our last trips, which was fun as always. So sure if was. anyone who knows Tanya, or, and maybe there's some folks on that don't know, know that you are tremendously passionate about helping women advance their careers um, within our industry, but also educating on the importance of diversity and inclusion and the value of having a diverse set um, uh, population within the employee ranks within the business, how critical that is to our success. And so I'm thrilled to have you leading this conversation today with passion. Excellent, thank you, Sue. It's, you know, like I said, near and dear to my heart when you launched the program, you know, I think it was back in February um, in Chicago, seeing the standing room only at our first event was a key indicator that the discussion was welcomed and, and certainly much needed. And I'm going to so kick that, it off. You know, I, what? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, having the conversation today focused on those, um, uh, the very important thing of taking control of your career. I know you personally have helped many, many women and individuals in our industry do just that you were actually instrumental in me kind of taking a very bold move and, and leaving a company after 15 years um, to be very intentional about taking control of my career and your support of women and Realogy's support of women in particular has been a, a key factor, not just mine, but a lot of people's success in coming here. So I personally thank you very much for that um, and I value your opinion and I look forward, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I will join you in a little bit, but enjoy the conversation today. Thank you very much, Sue. And I remember those deep conversations we had about your career move. So I'm excited to have this discussion today. You know, I wanted to just give a quick shout out to all of my Coldwell Banker leading ladies and others that are joining the conversation today. For me, um, it's just a, it's a conversation that's needed. Um, you know, in looking at the talent across our industry, we represent from a Realogy perspective over 10,000 employees. When you look at the agents we support, it's over, you know, 180,000 domestically, 122,000 um, internationally. And so we really have a good look into the talent that represents the company. You know, as Sue mentioned, I've had a, a personal passion for just diversity for many years. When I joined the company 18 years ago, the first thing I did was sort of recognize the landscape that we were in and the underrepresentation um, across the board, not just our company, obviously, but the industry at large. When you look at, you know, we were part of an aging industry, there was a significant lack of ethnic representation. And then, you know, in a at the time, especially a predominantly female dominated industry, there was a lack of female leadership as well as female ownership at the top. We've made significant progress. I have the great fortune of, of working side by side with women like Sue, like Kate Rossi, uh, you know, like Liz Geringer, Pam Liebman uh, from Corcoran, Sherry Chris from Better Homes and Gardens. It's been an amazing journey and I'm proud that we have our leading ladies at the top uh, in revenue generating positions. One quick story I'll share, and this was very recent, so you know we have a lot of work to do. Um, there was an, an industry conference that was being marketed um, with the you know leading um, leaders within the industry, and the, the panel was all men. And so, of course, I had to uh, put my words uh, in front of the person who was running the conference and just really shared my sentiments on in today's day and age, how can you have a, a panel of, you know, quote unquote leaders across an industry with no female representation. So great progress thus far. We still have a lot of work to do. And it's really through conversations like this 
um, that we change the trajectory. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be back here um, at What Moves Her. And, you know, as I mentioned in Chicago, we had a great uh, first turnout. I know there's been virtual conversations since. And I love hearing the stories about those that are engaging with us and really based on these discussions are making a decision to either level up their career, make a change in their career. So we're gonna hear a lot about that today. And so right now is a really important uh, time um, in our, in our uh, history, if you will, as we've really been given the opportunity to think very differently. So we're gonna talk about uh, controlling your career, we're gonna talk a little bit about empathy and continue on the, the topic of diversity. And if there's one takeaway I would say from today's discussion, it's that you know COVID has really opened our eyes for many. Um, it's given us a moment in time to pause, to rethink our priorities, level set, and reevaluate what's important to us, both personally and professionally. Um, the other conversation clearly that we've been having is just tied to the social unrest across the country. And again, it's almost given us permission to elevate the conversation about uh, race and diversity. So we must seize this moment in time. And with that, I'm thrilled to introduce our featured speaker, Passion Broussard. Passion is a listing concierge manager with Coldwell Banker, and she has an inspiring story to share with us, as well as some great nuggets uh, for all of us. So, so let's um, shift it over to Passion and learn a little bit about what moves her. So Passion, first off, um, welcome. I have to say, I love the name. It's a big name to, to live up to. So we're really looking forward to this conversation. So why don't we start off, uh, Passion, tell us a little bit about just your you know, career experiences, some of the roles that you've played. Absolutely. First, Tanya, thank you for having me. And second, you're right, that is a hard name to live up to, but I find from others that uh, I tend to be a very passionate person. So I, I guess my mom knew what she was doing when she named me that. Um, so a little about my background, I have uh, 16 now, 16 years in real estate, um, different roles from transaction coordinator to transaction director. Uh, actually it started then with realtor. <laughs> and then sales manager, and now I'm here with listing concierge as, as a uh, listing manager. So a lot of experience that I'm very grateful for, uh, and it just keeps growing and growing. Excellent. So um, Sue alluded to sort of controlling your career. She shared a little bit about, you know, she had a career uh, move. Tell us a little bit about, yeah. you know, what your view of that concept is. You know, I was listening to Sue's uh, story about how you helped her and what happened there. And interesting, she said 15 years because that is very similar to my story and that I was somewhere for 15 years. Uh, and I was very fortunate that someone saw in me things that I didn't see, you know, and it sounds like um, those those, conversa those conversations happen, right? And it's what you do with those conversations. It's, it sounds like you and Sue were having a conversation about that and it led her here. And so when you have someone, you know, that's having that conversation with you, um, it's what you do with that conversation and what action you take, you know, that leads you to the next chapter most times. And that's what happened for me is I was planning to go to law school. I was finishing undergrad and I had plans to go to law school because everyone else was saying that's what I should do. You know, you get a lot of people who tell you what you should do and, hey, I saw that you did this and you're really good at those contracts and you should consider this or that. But I saw um, the owner believe in me in a way that at the time, I must admit, I didn't realize what my natural strengths were and she saw them before I did. So what ended up happening was she talked to me about um, a, a further career in real estate. And to my surprise, the more that I committed myself to that and researched it and dedicated myself to it, I realized it was more aligned with my personality uh, what my natural strengths are. I mean, I love people. I love working with people. I love mentoring and coaching people. I love helping them uh, gain success, you know, in their plans and their businesses. And in hindsight, looking at it, you know, as an attorney, <laughs> I don't think it would have involved as much of that as, you know, a, a, a role in real estate does. So I was fortunate in that someone saw in me what I didn't see initially. And as I began to research that more and more, I realized, this is more aligned with who I am. 
And so um, Sue mentioned that her and I had many conversations about her career. We, we laughed. We probably uh, got close to becoming teary eyed and everything in between as, as she went through that decision making process. What were the conversations that you had to help you make that ultimate decision to, to change your trajectory? Well, there was a lot going on. I mean, I want to share that I'm also a single mother. I'm a single mother of a child with uh, a disease, a medical condition. And so there's a lot of thought that goes into any changes <laughs> that I'm making in my life, uh, more particularly financially. So for me, what that looked like was looking at the time, how much time would it re require, you know, to do this? Would I love it day in and day out? Is it something I could see myself doing long term? Um, also making sure that I would still have that flexibility to be the parent to my son. Um, I, I don't mind, I don't ever mind sharing any of my personal business <laughs> to a fault sometimes, and I'll share that his father passed away, so it was just us. I'm the only parent, so I had to make sure that whatever I was doing not only provided financially for us, but also allowed me the time to see him grow. You know, to be in the hospital for hospital visits if he had those, to be at the doctor's appointment so that I could know what was going on. Um, so as Sue mentioned, or as you just mentioned, you know, a lot of self, you know, really thinking about, is this going to work for me? Um, it's not my plan. That's the other thing. Sometimes we get so stuck to a plan. You know, I was in school and going for all of these pre-law classes. So my thoughts were, no, this is the plan. Um, so that's another thing that I had to adjust, you know, and pivot with and say, okay, wait, we can change this. We can do this in a way uh, that it works for us. And that became easier the more that I researched and realized that I loved real estate. It was easier to pivot and make that change and say, wait, I'm really into this. I really enjoy this. Uh, and I have a mentor who believes in me. And I have these connections and different people that I can reach out to. Um, so there were some hard conversations that I had to have with myself. <laughs> if I'm being honest. First. Um, and then with, yeah, me first. And then my family, because, you know, sometimes your family members and your friends will put a lot of shoulds on you, you know? You let people should on you a lot. You should do this and you should do that. And though you should stay in that role and, you know, and there was a lot of that going on. So next I had to have the conversations with them about, you know, look, I, this is my plan and what I'm planning to do. And I still need you here as my support but this is the direction that I'm taking. So yes, you are right, Tanya, a lot of conversations first with myself, um, doing some deep soul searching <laughs> and then conversations with family and friends to one, all, not just have their support, but also get them on board because, you know, I, I, those, but that's my, my circle, my support circle. I needed, I needed them to know what was next. I love that. So I heard, you know, someone saw in you strengths that you didn't see in yourself initially. You also went down a path of doing something you really, really loved. And then you and I talked a bit about as we were, you know, preparing for this conversation, that voice in your head that we often have. I know I, um, being Latina, uh, I had a voice always, I still do in my head from my family members basically saying, you know, you work too much, you're putting, you know, your career in front of your children and your family and so on and so forth. So I had to have those conversations with myself to cut that off. Um, and keep going yeah. in the direction that I thought was best, not just for myself, or for myself and my family. Yeah, yeah, it's so difficult. Thank you for right? sharing Sometimes that. they, no problem. It, it, yeah, it's difficult because you want them to understand and support you as well, but you also know what works for you, you know, and what you want to do and need to do. So it's, it's difficult. So with, so with that, you made a big shift, right, in your career. What was the biggest challenge that you were faced with and how did you overcome it? Hmm. You know, the biggest challenge for me was growing in that role so much, loving it so much. And after 15 years, realizing that the role was morphing into something else. And so was I, you know, the role not only changed, but I changed as well. Um, and then having to pivot and make another life changing career choice. That was difficult, you know, and I don't want at all to uh, ignore the fact that, as I said before, I, I, I one of the biggest challenges, not just in my career, but in life, you know, is the fact that I 
had to become a single mother of a of a, of a child with a, a medical condition. So there in itself was my biggest challenge ever. <laughs> But now as I'm getting that down and, you know, figuring out the rhythm and how that looks for us, um, I'm now faced with this career choice of look, this isn't really working for me. You know, I'm not feeling like my authentic self anymore. I'm not feeling like the role is, you know, using my natural strength and abilities the way it once, you know, had and really having to be honest with myself and make yet another uh, life changing career decision. So I I understand that you know you've had some personal adversity. Um, you're now you know a leader, and you've learned a lot through both uh, experiences. I I also understand that you one of your mantras is that you lead with curiosity. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means to you? I can. Um, I always try to ask myself. <laughs> I'll never forget. I got that this question actually from someone else, a really great uh, coach some years back, where. There was something going on and I will share this openly and honestly with everyone as a woman of color. There was an incident that happened. It occurred um, in my professional life. And I remember sharing with her that I was uncomfortable in, in how I felt about it. And she said to me, do you know that to be true? You know, and I began to share with her what I felt. You know, well, I know I felt like this and, and she stopped me and she said, do you know that to be true? And I was a little upset because it was a yes or no answer. And I had to answer honestly and say no, you know, and I found out later, you know, after having conversations and more information that what I thought was going on, um, there was a little bit there, but it wasn't all that I had made it. And that helped me to do things differently, staying in curiosity of do I know that to be true? You know what's happening right now, what I feel is happening, but also staying in curiosity with being able to see things from another perspective, someone else's perspective, honestly. You know, okay, why would that person say that? Or why why did that person think that? Let me ask more about that, rather than just jumping to conclusions. That's a, that's a great takeaway. And I think that ties into the topic of, of empathy. And I know that, at least for me, um, you know, I, I, I've learned a lot during the past couple of months um, from an empathy standpoint. We have been engaging with our employees that are struggling, um, you know, whether it's with just working from home, working from home with children, um, taking care of, uh, you know, sick uh, loved ones, as well as, uh, you know, becoming ill themselves and, and just everything in between. So we've really had to have much deeper conversations. I've enjoyed that because I think that's sort of how empathy becomes, you know, what it should be and, and really taking a, a deeper understanding at listening to what's really going on. Um, so share with us passion, if you will, just, you know, from an empathy standpoint, has your approach or view on empathy changed since the COVID crisis has come into play? Oh, by all means, absolutely. Um, I feel like I've always been an empathetic person, you know, someone who's strived to see things from a different perspective, um, someone else's perspective. And when COVID occurred, I have to share with you as a woman of color, um, I felt this heavy weight the day after uh, the George, George Floyd murder and when everything was happening with the looting and the rioting, um, I, I really struggled getting out of bed. And that is different for me, Tanya. I'm not that kind of person. You know, I try to align myself with things that I love and that I love to do even in my work because I generally have a positive spirit. And so when I felt that way, I knew it was more going on than what I realized. Um, it's just mentally, I was mentally exhausted. And I kept thinking, how do I go in? How do I go in and continue to lead my team and uplift them? And how do I be, you know, the person that they need while this is going on? And then I realized, why do you feel like you have to say something? <laughs> why don't you listen to them? So I came in that morning and instead of having, you know, a, a normal check in, first of all, and trying to like, you know, sweet, act like things aren't happening, <laughs> you know, because we're at work and that's what I think some people have been used to, you know, we're at work and this isn't the place for that. And, you know, but I can't be, I can't 
do my work well if I can't bring my full, whole, authentic self. <laughs> That's first and foremost. So coming in, I decided to talk to the team and just open the floor and ask them, how's everyone feeling about what's going on? How's everyone doing? And the information that I received, the feedback, uh, the vulnerability, um, the talk that we had, some of the things that people didn't understand, um, some of the things that people didn't agree with. You know, we got to talk about it and in a safe space. And that's one thing that I wanted to make sure that everyone understood. What you say here is, it stays here and it's a safe space and I want us all to be okay. And I want us to talk about this. And that did more for me, Tanya, than coming in and feeling like, you know, I have to lead, I have to make sure everyone's okay. Just listening to everyone helped me as well. We all got to talk about things. We got to explain things the way that we saw it. We all had some aha moments. You know, there were people who said thank you afterwards for sharing things that they didn't really understand. You know, and I was able to thank them as well for sharing with me how they saw it and why. So just having that conversation again, I love how you said at the top of this, you know, this time, you know, has kind of like given us the permission <laughs> to have these in conversations, you know? And I can't thank one of our fearless leaders, Ryan Gorman, enough for coming in the next day and speaking to this and saying the things that he said. It was so sincere. It was so spot on. It was so on time, you know, that I knew that I had done the right thing or I felt anyway that I had done the right thing the day before by having that conversation with my team. And I felt so proud to be a part of CB once Ryan Gorman shared his message with us of understanding and acceptance and what Cobalt Banker planned to do, really, you know, as a whole plan to do about this um, and, and change some things and really start paying attention and having conversations and, you know, being more involved. And I felt so proud. Thank you for sharing them. I, you know, I think a big uh, lesson, um, you know, the old adage, never waste a good crisis, uh, is to really listen and learn. And I know for me, those deep conversations that we've been having more of in the midst of COVID, in the midst of, you know, everything going on in the world, um, I'm, I'm hoping to carry that, you know, through with me in my career post COVID. And I know that, um, you know, for me, also being a woman of color, being a leader, um, having gone through much adversity, both, you know, prefer, uh, professionally and personally, you think that you have control of your career until you don't, right? And so, you know, COVID brought that to my attention as well in that, you know, it, I wasn't my whole self, right? I had a very separate personal and professional life and I, that's not, you know, my authentic self. So for me, I'm, 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 hoping to continue to bring my whole self and everything that I do now that there's this blend and the blend is indeed, you know, who I am. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'd love to hear a little Absolutely. bit about just, you know, on that note, Passion, has anything um, caused you to think differently about your career as it relates to this crisis, right? So we talked a little bit about it's this, you know, self-reflection -ref period, it's time to level set and really make sure that we, you know, as women, um, make the right career decisions for ourselves, find out the right people, be part of a company that we want to be part of. Um, and, and location matters less now, right? At least for the time being. That's so right. anything that you have just thought about differently as it pertains to your career? Yeah, I, I, you know, I want to go back to something you said. First of all, everything you said was beautiful and, and it to totally resonates. Um, I've had some challenges during this time. And like you said, you think you have control over everything, you know, and I had to realize for a minute that I was kind of getting a little off um, and had to kind of rein it back in <laughs> and find out, excuse me, find out what was going on there. Um, but you're right. We think that we have control. This happened and I thought I was fine. It was so interesting for the first few weeks. I was just fine. I was like, this is great. It's wonderful. We get to work from home, you know, and then after a few weeks that, you know, that wore off <laughs> and I realized, wait, we're stuck working at home every day doing this uh, indefinitely right now. Um, and so what that did for me was uh, it allowed me to take a different look at um, what my current role is, you know, and how does that change during this time? How do I continue to 
be creative in what I do so that one, my team stays engaged, I stay engaged, uh, we stay connected. Um, you know, it's 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 a really challenging time, as I said, with with having to feel like every day you're working from home just in this monotonous routine. And for me, looking at the things that I could do now that would continue to help me grow. Um, a lot of conversations with others, you know, and, and having those same conversations with them about what do we do during this time? You know, what are the benefits of this? What is this here to teach us kind of thing? You know, and and looking at my my role and putting some other things in place. I am very fortunate in that I've had many empathetic leaders and I, I don't know how I've been so blessed, but I have been, you know, and I have uh, some very empathetic leaders in um, listing concierge, Casey Ricker and Kim Powell, who allow me to do things that really do align with my personality and my natural strengths. And I get to start a coaching pro pro program. I get to mentor, you know, and I love that. That's what I said, you know, in the beginning was really what helps, what makes me thrive, you know? So I get to, during this time, continue to shape my role and my position in a way that works for me and also works for me during this time. So that creativity, that flexibility, um, you're, you're suggesting that now is a, a great opportunity to really shape the career that you want, shape the role that you're in, even do things differently than we have in the past because we have the opportunity to do just that. That's right. Perfect. You know, and if I'm being honest, it's, it's even it's also an opportunity to look at if I'm just being honest here to look at how are you feeling about coming in every day now at work when you mm -hmm. have to work from home every day. I really want to be clear and honest and transparent about that. If you are rolling out of bed every day and feeling like, oh, I got to do this again. And on Monday, your biggest wish is for the weekend. <laughs> you might want to start taking a look at that because this is the time to really start thinking about, OK, I have to do this every day now. Um, am I still enjoying it and liking it enough to some degree, you know, where I come in and I feel inspired and I feel like my team and everyone around me, you know, uh, supports me and I support them and we want to do this together. We're looking at the, the goal together, you know, really take a look at that because this time right now, this pandemic, COVID-19, just as it's doing in personal relationships for people, <laughs> it'll do this in your work of relationship as well, which is really show you the truth. You know, the truth of those relationships, the truth of your job, your work relationship. Is this something that you can withstand and sustain? Is this something you enjoy? You know, when tough times like this hit, are you still enjoying it and still finding a way to find the little things, you know, that make you happy to come to work? That's great. I know that uh, this is the new norm, at least for the foreseeable future. But, um, you know, you only can change your um, you know, room location so much. To, to diversify your environment, but it is what it is for the moment. So I get that. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about. <laughs> you can relate, right? Um, I'd love to. Yes. I'd love to hear a little bit about mindset. Um, Sue and Liz talked, uh, you know, a bit ago about just resiliency, um, mental toughness. Share with us, if you will, just your perspective on on mindset leading through a crisis. Yeah, the mindset. You definitely have to, uh, you, for, for me, that starts with self-care. It starts with self-care. If you are not taking care of yourself, you're going to find it challenging to be in, you know, anything, not just COVID, but a relationship or, you know, it, that that spans across different things. So self-care is important. Um, for me, I really started doing um, some different things that helped with that. Um, I, I always have loved yoga but I've gotten more into it and meditation while we're doing this because that that mindset, you know, as we're talking about of getting up every day and like you said, not being able to change the room. <laughs> you can only move the chair around so many times or turn around the table to get, you know, a different view, um, but just putting you in a, a, a mind space of um, knowing you're OK, being OK, being OK, okay to say to yourself, you know, I'm all right, you know, uh, and you need whatever it is that works for you to help you to do that. Um, I try to tell my team a lot, especially when I can sense that some people are getting, you know, a little agitated or or um, 
restless during this time. I try to make sure that they have some things that they're doing for themselves. Are you walking, taking a walk for a minute? You know, are you shutting down your computer and just understanding that, look, everything is not, you know, uh, that much of an urgency. No one will die if you don't answer that email, you know, in the next two minutes. Um, are you eating well? You know, all of these things that we know. Are you exercising? Are you, you know, if those things aren't for you, that's fine. But it could be, are you, what, what do you love? Music? You know, do you play an instrument? Are you doing something like that for yourself every day so that you aren't feeling like you are sitting in the same space at a computer all day long and answering and responding to people's demands and requests? You know, you have to make sure that you are in the right mindset to do that. And the beginning of that is making sure that you are okay. I love that. And we're hearing a lot more about, you know, self-care being a priority, especially during these times. Um, you know, a lot of meditation, a lot of yoga, a lot of exercising and, and eating healthy. I know one thing I shared with um, one of our ERGs, I think it was last week, is just my um, desire to juice regularly now. It makes me feel really good and it clears my mental state. But um, I think it's really important to make certain that it's not just sporadic, but there's a daily sort of ritual um, involved so that we can all make certain that we stay mentally and physically well. I'm going to switch gears. That's right. Passion. I'm going to go back to uh, the topic of diversity. And so, um, you know, as I shared earlier, I've always been very passionate about this particular topic. And we've had a lot of conversation over the past couple of weeks. And so I'd love for you to share. We have a diverse audience. You know, I've always been a proponent of uh, diverse teams, um, you know, bringing together a diverse group of, of employees or, or agents or what have you to make a, a better decision, right? Just the influence of, of that type of thought. So I'd love for you to share any advice that you would have for either diverse talent and or leaders of diverse teams that might be listening with us today on career growth um, in, it really in light of what's happened in, in the country. Yeah, you know, let me start with this first, Tanya. Everyone, especially myself as a woman of color, but everyone wants to feel like they belong, right? Everyone wants to feel accepted. They want to feel respected. Um, and that's no matter who they are because no one can bring their best to anything when they don't feel like they can be their true authentic selves. And so I think when you when you create a, a, a safe and positive nurturing environment for that, that's the first thing, you know, making sure that people feel that in an environment and that they feel that it's diverse in so many different ways. Um, when people are brought to the conversation, you know, when they are in rooms, you know, that feel very diverse, um, that is when people began to really understand and, and appreciate the diversity. And, and we, we all gain from that. We all benefit from the opportunity of those differences. You know, there are different strengths and talents that come into play when you have different people in different seats at the table and in the conversation. Um, I think it's important to keep your eyes open for that because like, we benefit from that. <laughs> and I think it's important to um, step outside of your comfort zone Sometimes, you know, you know, when you're like in high school and you have sometimes the little clicks, you know, and you could call it like the nerdy click over here or we have the cool girl click over here or, you know, people tend to stay in their clicks of, you know, what they know and what they're comfortable with. And I think you should challenge yourself to step outside of your comfort zone and get to know other people and their stories and their experiences. And I don't mean for a day. I mean, really make that a habit because we all benefit from it from learning different things in those conversations um, and, and from those different experiences. I, I wanna share one more thing. I gotta tell you, my family, <laughs> my family looks like if we're sitting at the dinner table for Thanksgiving or holiday, we look like the, the United Nations because we have everyone <laughs> in our family. <laughs> and I love, I love how much I, it just, the world just is so different to me because of it. Um, and I feel like it, I have so, beautiful information and knowledge because of it. And I am so blessed have much to more that, to talk about. Change it. That's right. Much and with so many more people. Table, right? I love That's that. right. I love got that. it. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, just just overall from a, you know, you, you've obviously made some career decisions that you shared. Um, you're with the company you're with now. Tell us, a little, you know, you had adversity. Obviously, you're a single mom, um, you know, m being a great mom to your son. Tell us about just your overall purpose. I really enjoy, as I mentioned before, I can't say it enough. I enjoy seeing other people succeed. Um, I have faith enough in myself that, you know, whatever I do, I, I will be OK. And so with that, what I love to do is make sure that others are, are OK. Um, I really enjoy right now. What I get to do at work because I get to see people grow. I get to see them develop and move into leadership positions when maybe they didn't think they could or they you know, wouldn't get there for a while. Um, that brings me joy. And that honestly is my overall purpose just in life. Let me share with you. I have had so many people help me throughout my career and my life in general. And I'm going to try to say this without, without tearing up because I always get teary eyed when I talk about this. <laughs> um, I loved hearing your story at the beginning with Sue, where she said you talked to her and that's how she got here. I love seeing people pull up others and say, look, I see something in you that maybe you don't see, or even if you do see it, you know, here are some resources, let me help you get there. Um, that I feel like is my purpose. And it really became clear to me as I matured you know, over the years and realized how many people helped me in my personal life and in my career. And if I can pay that forward just a little bit, just a little bit, you know, to some others, then I, I feel like that's a success for me. And I think that's such an important point. And when we talked about what moves her, when we launched this initiative, um, you know, we have to lift one another up as women, as women of color in our organization, outside of our organization. And, and so many of us have the opportunity to do that. I'd love to hear, however, and you mentioned you've been, you've been very fortunate to be surrounded by those that pulled you up, saw things in you that you didn't see yourself, but some don't have that same experience. So what, what is your advice to, you know, women or anyone that really are looking to change course, whether it's personal or professional, that don't have that support system? You know, the first thing I would say is it's important to find that belief in yourself. That's first and foremost. You have to know who you are and you have to believe in yourself because as you mentioned, Tanya, if you're in a situation where you don't have those mentors, you don't have the people to raise your hand to and say, you know, I, I need this. You have to know how to do that on your own, but you have to start by believing in yourself first. You know, who are you? What do you want, want to do? What do you love? Um, and then begin to put yourself in some of those places. Begin to you know, take some work. Let me, let me say that. It takes some work and some research, you know, in finding out who you are, what's important to you, where do you go to raise your hand and whom do you speak to? Um, I'll, I'll admit here that uh, I, I raised my hand to Sue. You know, I was inspired by a conversation that she and Liz was having and I just kind of jumped out. Hey, I'm going to take a leap and just let you know if you, you ever want to, you know, talk and have a chat. I, I'm open. You know, I was really inspired by the conversation. So that's the other thing. Raise your hand. Get to know people. Introduce yourself. Talk about what you love and who you are. Um, you know, some people, us as women especially, we feel shy, you know, to do that or like, hey, it's going to seem like I'm being a little braggadocious or I don't want to make everything about myself. And you don't have to, but what you should learn to do is know who you are so that you can authentically be you <laughs> so that it's coming from a place of um, authenticity when you're talking to someone and talking about yourself and what you want to do or what you love to do, because you never know when that conversation might open up to uh, other you know, opportunities for you. So I would say start with some, some deep soul searching, knowing who you are, what you want, believing in yourself. And then once you start you know, getting that information together and, and feeling good about that, start opening yourself up to, okay, who do I take this to now? Where do I reach out? You know, and then that's where things will begin to open up. Terrific. And I would just add, you know, for those joining us today, reach out. The uh, reason why I know for me personally, I've stayed with a company for 18 years is that I've been surrounded by folks that want to lift us up. Reach out to myself, Passion, Sue, 
you know, all of us that uh, surround Cobalt Banker and the company at large, because we'd love to have these conversations with you. I'm going to ask you one last question, Passion, and then we're going to open it up to some Q&A from the audience. So, and this is this is more of a personal question for me, because um, over the months talking about lifting each other up, um, I need some advice from you. So I've been through a lot. Um, came back into a situation here, leading through a crisis. You know, as a company, we went remote overnight. I was quarantined. Um, I lost a loved one. Uh, I have my mm. entire family living here with me. My my parents and my stepfather go figure. Uh, all of which are at some level ill. Um, and so I've gotten to know my husband because we both traveled a lot. Know my children. So everything has been happening. So I'd love to hear from you. I read your motto that you live by. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I'd not be able to share that with us. I have to apologize, Tanya. You were breaking up at the very end. You were talking about motto. I'm sorry. The motto that you live by that um, you shared with us. Can you share that with the audience? That everything is working for me, not against me. I, I love that. My life changed. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just say, Tanya, you have been thrown, it, whoa, a lot, a lot. And I think mm -hmm. when we can realize that, look, these things are, are happening for me, not against me. Uh, I mentioned earlier, and I really strongly believe in this. You know, I've heard some of, some of the greatest leaders say this, and it's very true. What is this here to teach me? We grow, right? We're, we're humans and every day we, we learn. You know, my friend told me this recently and it's, it, it really resonated with me. We were talking about someone and she said, you know, I told her, she's a tr you're not a tree. She said, you're not a tree, move. <laughs> and it resonated with me because, it, yeah, I loved that because it's so simple and it makes it, you're not always planted somewhere and grounded somewhere. We're not a tree, we get to move, we get to grow. We get to, you know, change and adapt. And so that's the beautiful thing sometimes in all of what sometimes looks looks like a mess to us. You know, it looks like, well, why is all this happening? And now it's this and now it's that. Um, I can't tell you getting up this morning, cutting myself, being excited for this talk and other things that happened. <laughs> I have to stop and breathe and say, this is just a part of the process. It's here to test me and show me that like once once we get through this talk, you know, this is all here to show me you got this, you got this, you know, and you do too, Tanya. You know, I think if we all can just remember that, that the things that are going on, this pandemic, the, the, the crisis, you know, and the racial tension and all of these things that were happening, now we're having a conversation about it. People are opening up and becoming more comfortable to do that. These things are here to work for us. It's up to us to do to, to decide what will we do with it. What will you do with it? That's right. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, perfect segue passion uh, to our first question. This is the fun part. Um, so I'm looking at the chat here. A lot of great questions coming in. I'll try and get to as many as I can. So the first one is um, that you're very inspirational. I think we all picked up on that from your engagement. How do you stay so calm and collective during these intense moments uh, in time? You always seem to be professional, balanced. We want to hear some of the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, <laughs> I have to be very, very honest with you. Um, I, my faith, my faith. I'm a person that's very steadfast, steadfast, uh, steadfast in my faith. And what that faith has done for me, honestly, everyone, is uh, it keeps me grounded in empathy keeps me grounded in curiosity, you know, to be able to, to understand that, as I said a minute ago, the things that are happening are working for me, not against me. Also, I'm able to, to with empathy and not think about myself, <laughs> not think about myself. All of this that we have, everything that's happening in the world, it's all bigger than us. It's all bigger than us. So when I can look at that and realize that and stay grounded in my faith and understand this is all bigger than me, I just play a little part in it, then I'm able to really look at the big picture and figure out, okay, what part do I play in this? What do I want to say? What do I want to do? Um, you know, how do I want to impact others? And so that is what keeps me grounded. 
goes back to, to mindset and really staying in control of, of you know, your decisions, uh, as you mentioned earlier. So um, going back to your experience of, you know, changing your career, some thought you were, you know, might be taking a step back in a different direction. Um, mm-hmm. The question is to just the perception of how women sometimes can be perceived as being emotional or fickle. Um, do you worry ever about making these big career changes and how that might be perceived as not being sort of bold or brave? I do not. <laughs> and let me share with you why. Um, I, you know, I don't struggle honestly with other with what how others see me and what others will think. I struggle more with is this right for me? And and let me be honest, that took some time. You know, we were all teenagers and 20 year olds and stuff at one time. Right. And you're trying to figure that kind of sense of self out during those years. But for me, I don't worry about what people think about, you know, image wise, what I should be or what I should be doing. I have to look at for me what works for me. Again, I'm a single parent of a beautiful young soul that has this life that has taught us so much from his challenges. And then mine as well because of of, the, of his challenges. And I don't have time, honestly, or energy <laughs> to worry about how people see me and what they think I should be doing. I have to fo- focus on what's right for us. Fantastic. So just tune them out. Tune them out. Tune them out. Uh, tune them out and do what's best out. for you. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So let's talk a little bit. About- the question came in on just overall balance. When work becomes a priority, a bit of that mom builder, how do you deal with that? Yeah. You know, that shows up for everyone differently, right? And I've had mom guilt too. I want everyone to know that. Um, I'll be honest, I wanted to be able to provide a lifestyle um, that my son and I would enjoy. And that means, you know, that means making some money. <laughs> Um, But I also wanted to be uh, there in his life um, the way that he knew me to be. I I will share with everyone um, what has worked for me. I have had many different positions in my life, and it is because I knew what was important to me, um, and I had to balance the two. I had to balance what was important to me, which was my son, my family, but I also balanced the lifestyle part, and that was a decision on my end, right? That, look, I want us to live this way, so... I have to make this the sacrifice of the two where you just can't give 100% honestly to both. So how much of that percentage goes here and how much goes there? Um, I was lucky in that I was able to create different positions and roles where I was able to stay with him. Um, and what I mean by that was I was out for some, for, for some years when I was younger. I was a preschool teacher at his school. Probably sucked for him, but it was beautiful for me because I got to be around him and see what was going on and know when things were happening, you know. And so I kind of created my life that way based on my values and what was important to me. Um, That does not mean that I've never had mom guilt. I have absolutely had it, but what I've had to stand strong in were my decisions. And that's why I said make decisions that are important to you, not someone else because I was able to to say, I'm making these decisions for my family. And I know that it will come back to benefit us. That's great. And I appreciate you sharing the preschool story. I haven't heard of that one. That's a pretty good strategy (laughs) to be a preschool at your son's school. Um, I love that. I'm a little controlling, Tanya. I'm a little controlling. (laughs) We're going to have to talk more about that. But uh, you know, the mom guilt too, I think for, for those that of us that have it, and we all have it from time to time. And, and the one thing I keep top of mind uh, when that sort of comes into my purview here is just that I do what I do for my daughter and, and my son, of course, but as a, as a female leader paving the way for our children. And it's really one of the best ways to demonstrate the possibilities. Um, so I'll move on to the next. The next question is tied uh, back to diversity. We've had a lot of conversations you know, for many years, obviously, they've accelerated in the past couple of weeks. What conversations from your perspective, passion, have not yet occurred that need to? I think that's a great question. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you guys are really bring the fire <laughs> on this one. You know, I'm going to share with you something that 
just happened. It happened recently um, after, like I said, after the George, George Floyd mur murders and, you know, the rioting and the looting and all of those things happened. Um, the conversations that my best friend and I felt like weren't happening were, were um, and let me share that Coldwell Banker has done this, where we've had the ACE and EREG group talk about what it means to live as a person of color. You know, really sharing those experiences so that others could understand. I don't think we have enough around being able to freely and openly and comfortably share what it means and how sometimes you feel like you have to work a bit harder to be seen or to be recognized or understood. And there's not enough conversation, you know, that that exhaustion that comes with that of feeling like I got to give 150 percent, you know, to, to make sure that uh, my voice is heard or that uh, I, I, people see what I do as successful. Um, so just those conversations about the differences um, when it comes to people of color and the different things that they have to do just to feel involved and included in conversations and work in work environments and making sure that others understand it's not them um, it's not them necessarily complaining or you know saying that someone's wrong for not understanding but just trying to get others to understand so that some of these experiences that we've had in the past can be changed for the better. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you for that. I, um, you know, I think this next question relates somewhat, somewhat to that. But um, how do you? We talked about, you know, the voices in our head telling us what to do. How do you overcome a voice in your head that tells you you're not good enough? Mm. You know, I'm lucky in that I surround myself with really good people, important people in my life. Um, I don't have a huge circle, but the people that I do are people that I've known for a long time um, and who are people that I can go to if I'm ever questioning myself or anything. So there's that. But also, um, we're going to have that from time to time, right? That's just human nature. Uh, there's not a whole, there aren't a whole lot of people who just go through life, you know, I'm perfect, everything about me is perfect, there's no chatter in my head, everything's all good. <laughs> you know, you're going to question yourself from time to time, you're going to have those moments of, am I good enough for this? You know, and the truth is when that comes up, what you have to do is know how to have that counter talk. You have to understand how to be able to go back to some of your accomplishments, go back to some of your successes, some of those things that got you where you are. You know, be that in parenting, be that in your work, be it in a relationship, whatever it is, look at some of your successes and pat yourself on the back. I think we don't do that enough, you know, is pat ourselves on the back sometimes. All of us that are getting through this pandemic and working the way that we're working, <laughs> I think we need to pat ourselves on the back, you know, for getting through this crisis and still remaining here, you know, at the job and still giving ourselves, you know, and giving of ourselves and, and being, you know, committed. You know, when you are feeling like you are not good enough, just go back to some of the things that you have successfully done and remind yourself of that. I agree. I would add, remind yourself of that to build your confidence. Remind others of that, right? Others that are around you. It's okay to speak up. It's okay, you know, not boastfully, but it's okay to go back to the facts, the impact that you've had. I know one of my sort of mantras, and those that know me know that this is a big one for me, but it's, it's saying what no one else will, and that's okay. It's okay to mm. say the unpopular. It's okay to speak up. And for me, that's really helped me, um, you know, grow my career. So speaking of career, I'd yeah. love to hear passion from you. One last question, then we're going to actually invite Sue to join us. But um, how do you focus on, you know, creating a career versus just a job? That goes back to knowing what's important to me. You know, and I talked about this a little bit. My values really stand, uh, my foundation is my family, my son. I'm making sure that I'm there for him. So I've created my life around that, hence the school, school teacher. I, for me, this doesn't work for everyone, but for me, I have created or I realize I will have to put in some work, some extra education, some extra time to make sure that I am there for him, you know, in the capacity that 
he needs me, you know, and I think a lot of it is overeating to be honest with you because, you know, his father passed away, but that is the life that I wanted to make sure I had with him. I don't ever want to regret on my deathbed not being there for my child. Work will be there and I love my work, get me wrong, but I try to make sure that the work works for me. The work needs to work for me so that I can be there for this beautiful soul. And I, again, I've been blessed to have that happen for me with the different leaders and mentors and, you know, people that I've been with. I'm here at Coldwell Banker Listening Concierge, where when I came in, Tanya, that's one of the things that I said, hey, I've been working 24-7 for quite a long time and I did it for a minute, but now I need some of my time back. And it's like Maxine Waters. I was saying, I'm reclaiming my, and I needed that time back to be able to be with, you know, my son again and deal with a lot of medical stuff that we're up against. And luckily for me, Again, knowing my worth, knowing my values, knowing what I wanted and coming in and saying that. And lucky for me, they said, you got it. You got it. So it's important to know what you want. And like you said, speak up. Say what others might be afraid to say. Well, if I say that, I might not get the job. Well, that means it's not right for you. You speak up and say, know what you want and what you need. I couldn't agree more. And so, you know, for me, the biggest takeaway of our conversation, Passion, is we all have to focus on ourselves first as the priority. It might feel unnatural to put ourselves before our profession, to put ourselves before even our children and our families. But if we don't do that, we will never get to our best self in, uh, in any of those aspects of our life. So with that, I'd love to um, have Sue join us back here, maybe just for some uh, wrap up conversation. Hey, guys. Hi, Sue. Thank Hi, thank you. I swear I just sat here like passion when you said if the, you know, define what you want, know what you want going into a role and don't be afraid to ask for it because if they can't give it, it doesn't work for you. I was like, yes, right? Like, because it's also the fact that if they can't make it work for you, they're not going to make it work for you. And that's okay too, right? I mean, we can't always expect right. everything to bend as you know, leaders and, and taking control of our career starts with defining what we want, right? And, and then finding something that fits it. We can't always, sometimes we're fortunate and the role we're looking at, you know, marries with what our needs are. Sometimes it doesn't, but we also can't expect the world to bend to that too, right? I mean, not everybody would have allowed that. So that's awesome. And man, are we lucky to have you on our team. This was incredible. I, I really thank you ladies so much. And Tanya, you know, I was laughing. We've had not just five years ago, that first, you know, couple conversations. And then you went out and had a baby in the midst of that. And, and our, our wonderful uh, colleague, uh, Angie McDonald, you know, stepped in and helped me come here and join the company. But uh, we've had them over the years, right? As as different opportunities have come and as we've grown as moms and leaders and, um, you know, a theme that I've heard today through from both of you and in our last couple, you know, what moves their series um, of events is this idea of who are you listening to, right? I mean, it's, you know, um, who are you making the decisions for and who matters and, and how do we, you know, drown all that out and stop listening or help bring people along, right? I think that's a really important component. I know, Tanya, you've had to sort of bring your family along, your extended family on your passion for work, right? And and the different dynamic and yeah. passion, you've sort of had to bring work along with, with your, you know, with, with whose voice you're going to listen to. And I just think that's amazing to see both sides of that. And Sue and, and Passion, I know there was one last question here just regarding mentorship, and I think it's it's relevant to share. I don't have a specified mentor. Uh, my mentor in life was my grandmother, and she taught me to always do the right thing. But I view so many people I work with as mentors. I, you know, talking about asking questions, Sue knows this. I pick up the phone. I ask her for advice, whether it's business advice or advice for, for my career, or even my personal life. You know, so many of the other women that I mentioned, Liz and, and others, I, I just, I mean, and it's constant and it's, you know, over the weekend, it's, it's a text late at night and we're all there for each other. That for me is mentorship that I, that I, you know, treasure tremendously. Yeah. It, uh, agreed. Agreed. It, the, uh, sorry, Sue, I was, I was going to add on to Tanya's comment that it doesn't have to be necessarily a family member or a friend. You're right. Mentors are all around you. You just have to 
see them and raise your hand. I, if I'm being honest, I have mentors that report to me. I have empathetic little leaders that I learned from. When I came here, I didn't have the institutional knowledge here and they remember what it felt like to be new and they helped me, you know? So mentors are everywhere. You just have to pay attention. And I think they shift and evolve, right? With your needs as, as your time changes, you know, um, I, and I, I've never had a, a quote unquote formal mentor and I've been asked that a lot. I'm also, you know, been, I've been asked to mentor people and I always say, just pick up the phone and call me. Like sometimes the time that you need the help is that unscheduled, just, Hey, you know, help me think through this or, or what should I be contemplating or what would you do? And I never like to necessarily tell people what I would do, but rather what thought process I would use to approach making a decision, right? Because everybody's lens is different. And I know we're up on time. I feel like this conversation could continue forever. And um, I think, you know, we are all looking at everything through a different lens today, whether it because of COVID and, and, and parenting during this and, and being caregivers during this time to others and, and parents or, or children and whomever that may be. And um, what's going on with the racial tensions in our country and, and, you know, that have been just so, you know, front, which they should be, right? And I think, I love that we got into some of that conversation today because it is important and people are often uncomfortable and we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable or things are never going to change. And we mentioned the, the Coldwell Banker, the Realogy, really, the, the entire Realogy town hall with the ERGs and, and the focus on, you know, we, we pivoted just to have a day, right? A time focus on what was going on in the country. And, you know, what I learned through that, and I continue to evolve as, you know, a, a, a woman, you know, like a Caucasian woman here who's had, was redefining, and I think it was Roderick Logan who said it, redefining what privilege means. And that's been really important for me is just to, for me, privilege was always wealth. Right. And, and it's not something I had. I didn't grow up with money. I didn't grow up wealthy. So I never thought of myself as privileged. But just hearing the framing of never having to think, I'm sorry, twice about walking into a store or doing that just it's eye opening. And so whether it's a small nugget like that, which is really massive, um, every time we have a dialogue or conversation on diversity and inclusion and forwarding the dialogue um you know i'm all in we're all in continue to have them respectfully and respect when people don't know right i mean it's not always someone's fault right it's it's an education so i i just so i true. think we can ask about some books i will say especially in the real estate industry the color of law is a very important book to read mm um on on um systemic racism in our country and 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 laws and and how we got to a lot of it's, it's a phenomenal book so i will i will um leave folks with that book recommendation if you will and and i'm i'm more of a like you know read the spy mystery novel or something at home but <laughs> that is that's a good book that's a good read so well, listen, ladies, thank you so very much for your time, for your honest conversation, for being true leaders and inspirations, you know, inspirations for, for, for people on this phone, for people that you work with, and of course, I'm sure your families and everyone else. So thank you so, so very much. And for everybody, you know, we got a lot of great questions. This is recorded, so you can find it and listen to it, and we will continue the dialogue. Uh, so thank you both very much. Thank you. And Passion, your name you, you. your name is perfect. Couldn't be more fitting. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Sue. Bye, thank everyone. You. Uh, amazing. Once again, I'm, I'm so inspired and so grateful that these amazing women are willing to take their time and share with all of us, with all of you, and help us grow every single day and and as someone said in the midst of the chaos and crazy that's going on it's nice to take some time to focus on you and passion touched on a little bit um taking care of ourselves during this time and and both mental and physical health and for those of you that don't know august is national wellness month and it's a month where you're to focus on self-care and health and promoting healthy routines and behaviors so we thought it would be a phenomenal month to bring a special guest on to present to you so at our next event in august we are going to welcome delia posse 
the founder of the Women's Choice Award, to join us next month. What's amazing about Delia and her story is Delia was the uh, former publisher of women, uh, Working Women and Working Mother magazine. And she went through her own series of, um, of wellness challenges when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And what she realized was there was a tremendous lack of resources for, for businesses focused on the woman consumer. And she had some challenges. So she founded the Women's Choice Award, of which Caldwell Banker is honored to be a three year in a row recipient of. And it is, it is a focused um, effort to provide insights to women on what businesses provide to them as consumers in the best way possible. Voted on by women. There's a tremendous process that I'm sure she'll talk about. But we're going to talk a lot about wellness, well-being, putting yourself first, both mentally and physically. So we'll continue this conversation next month. Thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the time today.